Today is January 29th, 2018, and you're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 75. Today on Human Factors Cast, we're talking about VR snowboarding, the rise of RoboCop, how Amazon Go is changing the way we shop, and more. Don't worry about motion sickness. There's glasses for that. Human Factors Cast starts right now. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. What's up, everybody? Coming at you live from the Sandy Desk. How are you? Hey, I'm good. I'm good. And... And we have an and today, and our special guest today, Mr. Joe Ott. Welcome to the show. Hello, hello. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. And uh, Blake, I'm jealous of your standing desk. Ah, yes. Do you not have one for the house? I do not. I'm saving up. They're not there cheap. You go. So, Joe, just to jump in here really quick, just so our listeners get to know you a little bit, could you let us know what company you work for and what your job title there is? Absolutely. So I uh, work at a defense company, uh, mainly specializing in aerospace called Northrop Grumman. And I serve there as a human factors engineer working on a multitude of projects, uh, but primarily ground control stations for autonomous air vehicles or drones. Cool. So autonomous air vehicles and drones, those are the kind of projects you work on. Uh, Are those also your interest areas or uh, your current area of interest or is that kind of like a, a thing that work did for you and then and then you have your own interests off off uh, somewhere else sure uh, I've always been really into aerospace uh, I'm actually a private pilot myself um, there was a time when I was going to do that for my career uh, but that didn't work out um, so always had this this you know superb interest in aerospace and everything with wings on it uh, and there's many different uh, areas of expertise for human factors, as you know, um, and a lot of it was really born out of the cockpit. Oh, so yeah. in terms of why uh, I work here and, and, you know, is it, is it my interest? Yes, uh, UAVs are essentially the future of aviation. Uh, we're going to see more and more of them because despite what all us man pilots say, they can fly straighter than we can. They can conserve fuel more than we can. They can make decisions faster than we can. So... Uh, It's kind of the inevitable truth that all manned pilots have to face. Well, excellent. We're glad to get your perspective on the show today. Uh, But I want to check in with you guys. What's been going on in your lives? Blake, I see some stuff here in your banter section. What's going on? Oh, man. Okay, so over the weekend, I decided to go and... Uh, on what's called a caffeine crawl. So think of going to a pub crawl, but it's all coffee. And it was it was one of those things where I was thinking, like, it'd be fun to do with the girlfriend, but really, what is each of one of these coffee shops going to have that's different about them? I mean, at the end of the day, it's coffee, whether it's good coffee or bad. I mean, it's just coffee, right? And I found that the real differentiating or differential factor between all these shops was the story they were telling with their brand, whether it was like, walking into the shop and seeing giant murals from local artists or if it was how they actually crafted their coffee or where they got their beans from and the relationship with the farmer. It was just another one of these examples because I feel like I bring this up a lot on the show. It's just like the the importance of that physical experience that you give people. And especially with San Diego, like there's a lot of craft breweries and craft eateries as well as like craft coffee. And making sure that these kind of local and small businesses survive i think it's really important that they craft a good story to tell for when like customers come in for the first time to really understand like why we're here and what they actually have to offer so that was kind of what i did over the weekend um it was so, a lot of fun drink way too much coffee though I so, was very so what, very caffeinated what time did you end up going to sleep that night because that's sounds... uh well so the, it worked out nice because it went we went from like nine until about noon hit about six coffee shops throughout san diego and then there's actually a cider and mead place near my house that opened, and I know the owner. So we popped up there and tried some of their new cider and mead. So it was a nice, relaxing afternoon. Got to bed at a normal time. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, and so do you want to talk about the other thing on your list, or do you want to save that for? 
Oh, here, yeah, I'll throw that in. Okay. So I don't, I don't know if you know if either one of you guys are familiar with this particular water bottle, right? But there's one called Hydro Flask, and it's it's just like a lot of these other, you know, water bottles that are vacuum sealed to keep stuff real cold. But somebody actually showed me that it can be used in a multi-purpose fashion as a foam roller. So that was one. It was just oh. a weird instance where I was like. How in the world did somebody figure that out? But it was it's just a cool product because it has so much a different use from just its intended purpose. And you don't really see that as much anymore with a lot of like software and hardware. Right. Yeah. No, especially for something like a flask that you would take to it or at least a water bottle that you'd bring to the gym. Uh it makes makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and it's 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 I mean it's heavy duty enough that it can take my weight and I weigh like 190 pounds. So I mean and it does the job, and it makes me makes my life easier not having to carry as much stuff. Um, so I figured I'd throw that out there for everybody. But Nick, what have you been up to, man? Well, hang on. Before I get into my stuff, I want to check in with Joe, because we were talking a little bit before the show uh, about his thoughts on the Hawaii missile alert thing, and he wanted to give his two cents. So I want to make sure he has a platform to do that before I jump into my stuff. <laughs> sure, yeah, thanks. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not quite sure how much you've talked about it in the past, but... Uh, it's just uh, another example of something that's completely avoidable if proper human factors design is taken into account. Um, so the story goes, obviously, you know, uh, the alert came through middle of the night. It was a user error that resulted in this alert being pushed out. Um, I read a little bit into this and, you know, heard some stories and apparently, um, the system that they were using, uh, had a drop down menu. One line said, execute mission warning test, and the other line said, execute mi- missile warning. And they're right next to each other, and apparently there was no secondary confirmation. <laughs> Which, for something so serious, I mean, you would just assume they had some sort of failsafe in there, but yeah. apparently not at all. Uh, so they sent out the wrong message, didn't know how to... So that was the first issue. Second issue is they didn't know how to retract the message. They didn't know how to basically correct it uh, and issue a correction. So so they uh, spent like 30 minutes or something, because this is the middle of the night, uh, calling their IT guy, trying to wake him up, trying to get him to log into the system and, and help him out and fix this, um, which he finally did, and then issued the correction way later. So, uh, you know, there's just so many principles of UX design right there that uh, were clearly not followed that could have easily prevented all that. Um, And you see this a lot, uh, particularly in aviation. There's a lot of, you know, accidents and incidents that are completely preventable. Uh, Just, uh, you know, it's all those unknown unknowns that kind of pop up and, um, you know, people experience an unfortunate we have to learn from. But this one, you know, there's no excuse. We know how to make drop down menus. We know how to make right. pop up dialogues that say, Are you sure? <laughs> you know, it just seems so brainless to me. Yeah. And if any of our listeners are curious, we actually posted, uh, so we posted the actual stories in our Slack, but we actually posted some amplifying stories on, on that as well, uh, which kind of look at the interface of what they were looking at. So you can actually see uh, the interface that they were actually interacting with when that whole thing went down. And yeah, it's embarrassing that. You know, we don't have a UX or human factors check to kind of go, go through the steps and say, yep, no, we're good. This is this is going to make uh, even just simple fixes could could have uh, really changed the outcome of that. Yeah, I mean, uh, and again, it was a compounding issue by the fact that they couldn't even get in to fix it. They, they weren't knowledgeable enough to know how to do that. And I guess there was no interface for that to quickly issue some sort of fix either. Right. Hey, so, okay, guys, I want to jump in and talk about a couple things that I did this week. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned last week, I think I said I was going to go do this thing, which is uh, it's a hyper-reality experience. And what that is is basically virtual reality, but they also mask other senses uh, like audio, and uh, they actually do some physical elements as well to, to sort of build this entire experience. And basically it's, it's a star Wars experience and everybody knows I'm a star Wars guy, but, uh, so I did this for my birthday this week and, um, what, what ended up happening? Well, I, I kind of want to talk about this in two ways. I want to talk about this from the naive user, the person who's never been in VR before, who this is their first exposure. And then I want to talk about it from my perspective. So 
let me let me get into it from someone who's never done this before. So you get into this space and you suit up. You put on basically this backpack that's a computer on your back, and then you put on the headset. Uh, you strap yourself in. They're giving you instructions. You stand in this room. You put the headset down, and in front of you, uh, they they tell you. I went with my partner, and they tell you to look at each other, and then put the visors down. And in front of me, materialized a, a person that was way too short to be a stormtrooper, but nonetheless, um, she was there in in stormtrooper fashion, and I presumably was in stormtrooper armor to her as well. And then the world kind of digitizes around you into the Star Wars world and then you step onto this ship and then the floor starts vibrating to make you feel like you're moving and you come up to this planet and you see it's it's a lava planet mustafar if you're familiar and uh and basically as soon as the door opens you get blasted with heat and wind so already there's multi-sensory inputs going on here and then you know later on they um sort of have you interact with components in the physical environment. So everything that you're touching in the virtual environment is a physical component in the real environment. And so like if you were to walk through a doorway, you could actually hold on to the uh, the door as you walk through it. Um, and every wall is a real wall in the physical environment. Um, so it was really interesting in that regard. Um, I think people who have never experienced, like my, I think my favorite part of this whole thing was a father and daughter who came out bef- after me and they were like, what time do you guys have open tomorrow? We got to do this again. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. Because I mean, that's how we're going to grow the, the desire for virtual reality, especially these experiences out in the world. And I, and just to correct me if I'm wrong, but the reason they call this hyper reality is because you're actually able to walk through the space. You're not just kind of sitting stationary with the VR headset on. They call it hyper reality because they mask a ton of senses. <clears throat> it's multi-sensory with, with how you experience this thing. Yeah, it almost reminds me of those uh, quote unquote 4D theaters like at Disneyland and stuff, you know, where, <laughs> yeah, uh, they rock you around in the seats, they blow air in your face or, you know, just really add that extra emphasis on what you're seeing. That's a, that's a pretty good burn, Joe, uh, <laughs> because uh, Blake and I were going to go see Star Wars in 4D, but uh, it, uh, it stopped, they stopped showing it in the theater like the weekend that we wanted to go see it. So, oh, Oh, they had one in 4D, a Star Wars, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, it, wow. it was The Last Jedi. So, But anyway, um, so yeah, so that was from the perspective of somebody who's never done VR before. So from my perspective, uh, the entire time, it, like, I really, I really was trying to, like, just enjoy this because it's my birthday and I, like, wanted to, you know, do this for fun. But I found myself going, okay, where are we in the physical environment? Okay, and what kind of tracking mechanisms are they using to map our hands? And then also, like, um, you know, keeping track of the physical environment, but then also um, what kind of techniques were they using in virtual reality? And what does the actual physical world look like? And how, what are the tracking things going on? So there's there's a lot that I was processing while I was going through this. And um, as kind of like a critique... I noticed that so at the beginning they like tell you to look at your hands and their stormtrooper hands and um you know to make sure the tracking was okay they put nothing on our hands to track them so it was cameras in the environment or or cameras on the headset or something that allowed us to actually see our hands in the virtual environment and when I looked at my hands my right hand was fine but my left hand kind of went a little crazy like if you imagine it was just flailing everywhere that's kind of what it looked like from my perspective uh, thankfully I know these systems well enough. I was wearing a Fitbit and on my Fitbit, there's a heart rate monitor that like flashes green light. So I think that may have had something to do with it. So I kind of took that off and put it in my pocket and I saw immediate results. Uh, but then later on, another funny thing happened where I was looking over at my partner and we like, we have to grab a gun. So we grab these guns and you would think that, you know, it'd be a one-to-one mapping. You're holding a gun, like you would hold uh, a rifle or something. And then, um, you know, I look down at my hands and I see what my uh, the hand that's on the grip um, pulling the trigger is fine. But then my left hand, I look over and it's way stretched over on my partner's gun. So like there was there was some weird tracking issues going on that uh, kind of took me out of it a couple times. But um, but it was overall a pretty cool experience. I got to say. That sounds pretty intense. Nick, how was the the 
multi-sensory aspect of it because I just feel like that would have been super in some ways overwhelming for somebody like me who hasn't really done too much VR had many VR experiences sure for me like I knew I was standing in a room where someone had, was pointing a heater at me with wind like I kind of knew that's what was going on so um I wish I could enjoy it like okay let me just make one other comment though my partner normally gets motion sick when I put her in VR stuff and she was able to make it through this in its entirety. She said she got a little bit of discomfort in, um, near the uh, near the beginning, but overall, it was just uh, it was she was able to make it through, and she had a blast. So there's that. Well, that's <coughs> sorry, <laughs> that's awesome, man. I'm glad that she was able to enjoy it as well, like not getting the motion sickness problem. Because I remember you telling me that, and I could imagine being in this like hyper experience that i would feel that way because i would i would have a harder time like really trying to understand my environment and how it is that all this stuff's like really moving along i don't know but sounds like a cool cool experience joe do you have any kind of questions for nick about the hyper reality yeah yeah, totally so just to clarify was it more like augmented reality or was it a hundred percent like virtual where you know you couldn't see through the goggles or yeah it was 100 percent virtual so they actually put you in uh the star wars universe um, so that's, that's why I was saying, like, I'm trying to figure out, deduce where I was in physical space to, um, you know, to see how they were pulling this off. Yeah, I guess. To, well, first question, did you run into anything that you weren't trying to, uh, no, <laughs> no, you, everything didn't was... hit a wall or something when you're trying to go through a door. So that's pretty good. No. Cause see that, that's what I'm wondering. Like if you really can't see anything at all, you know, it's not augmented, it's all virtual, uh, what's the what's the overlap with you know the real world you're walking what is there latency like was there any delay in anything it was all no it was all pretty all pretty good it was all pretty much one-to-one i noticed a little bit of latency only because i was looking for it but uh my partner she she was fine and um you know i think that one-to-one mapping the virtual environment to the physical environment um was really good for her because she felt like she was moving in actual space, and if she ever got like woozy, she could put her hand up on the wall. And just knowing that, I think, kind of helped facilitate it. But I hate to cut it short, but we got to get to the news stories this week. And before we do that, I just want to shout out to our uh, Human Factors Cast community Slack. Uh, so welcome, Brittany, who we didn't call out last week. Oops, sorry for that. Welcome to the Slack, Brittany. And also, Benjamin joined uh, Slack this week. Welcome, guys. If you guys want to join our Slack, the link is in the show notes. Uh, me, Blake, and Joe is going to be hanging out there. So if you want to talk about anything on the show, you can find us there. Um, and just to kind of give you a, a little teaser, we're already starting to discuss some of the stories from next week. So do check in there and see what's going on. But let's go get into Human Factors News. This is the part of the show all about Human Factors News. This is where we talk about everything related to the field of Human Factors. This could be medical, transportation, aviation, AI, VR, whatever it is. You name it. As long as it relates to the field of Human Factors, it's fair game. Blake, what do we got up first this week? Well, keeping in line with what we were talking about with VR. So when Olympic skiers and snowboarders prep for competition, they have limited access to their actual rate routes ahead of the competition. And that's all changing for the U.S. ski and snowboard teams this year, thanks to virtual reality. The team has used VR to review routes multiple times before they actually compete on them. So they've been been working with a company named Striver, that's S-T-R-I-V-R, which is which has developed VR training programs for, for professional sports teams, college sports teams, and even companies like Walmart, Visa, and Lowe's. Now, Striver is helping the U.S. ski and snowboard team prepare for competitions like the World Cup and upcoming Olympic Games by allowing them to relive particular routes as many times as they want. So, guys, I cannot imagine how much this adds to, you know, your preparedness for competition. I mean, we were just talking about... Um, living in or experiencing kind of like a hyper reality uh, through VR. And I wonder if something like that can be applied here and how much of an edge that will give you within a competition. Yeah. You know what? This almost reminds me of that scene in cool runnings, uh, <laughs> you know, the Austin bobsled Jamaican bobsled st- story um, where they're in their hotel room and, and they're in like the bathtub all huddled up and they're practicing their routes for the the track tomorrow. And they're memorizing each turn and it seems to be a method of that madness. It seems like that's that's how they do it. They practice each route dozens of times beforehand, of course, with their imagination. So uh, I could only see this being a huge benefit. 
You know, it's funny that you mentioned Cool Runnings because that was the first thing I thought of when I saw this story. Really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's perfect. It's analogous for sure. Yeah, this goes back to uh, one of the things that we were saying is that, you know, VR is not just going to be for video games. It's going to have other real-world applications outside of that, and that's going to be its real strength, right? It's not just going to be for these um, video game experiences that are fairly simplistic. This is kind of taking a real-world thing that people are training for and allowing people to experience that before they actually get there um and i mean you know we've seen sort of this virtual tourism start to rise as well and this is kind of like that but even more intense because you're actually training for something yeah and i mean another application here that we've talked about before is using this for you know performing different types of surgeries that are very hard to do or if a surgeon's really new i mean you can get hours and experience the exact same, you know, going through the motions of, let's say, like uh, operating on a heart as many times as you want to get comfortable with it. I mean, the same thing applies here, being able to hit runs and make turns that you wouldn't normally get to make ahead of time. It just it should give you such an advantage over, you know, just trying to like you guys were talking about, have an imaginary, you know, run through the courses. Yeah. And, you know, they use they use they've been using. I wouldn't call it virtual reality, but simulation to perfect skill sets for a long time now. Uh, I mean, the Army has been doing that. The Navy has been doing that. You know, the FAA has been doing that uh, for, I think, a decade or, or probably more. Uh, they count high quality, you know, flight simulators as actual flight hours. Like you get to log those hours in your book because it's so realistic. And it doesn't even have to be a full motion simulator. I'm just talking, you know, it's like a wraparound, like 180 display. And uh, that's all it takes. And you're basically playing Microsoft Flight Sim. It's just like the realistic controls uh, are wired into it enough where it represents real flight hours. And that's how many pilots perfect their skills, uh, especially in today's age with, you know, the increasing amounts of automation on the aircraft, like I was mentioning. Um, uh, there's always a concern with skill degradation, right? If there's an emergency or they need to, you know, take control of the aircraft, take it out of uh, autopilot mode. Uh, if they don't get to do that very often, they're not going to be very good at that. So they utilize VR and more so VR, but traditionally simulations to keep their skills sharp and on point. Yeah, good points. Uh, all right, well, we are running up on time. So let's go ahead and jump into the next story here, Blake. All right, for sure. So last week, Ford's patent for an autonomous police vehicle was review revealed by the U.S. Patent Office. So Ford wants to use machine learning tools like deep neural networks to find good hiding spots to catch violators of traffic laws. The proposed autonomous fleet would have immersive surveillance capabilities, including such things as road sensors, license plate readers, touch-sensitive panels, speakers, LiDAR, ultra ultrasound sensors, microphones, and even satellite connectivity to, uh, to just add to the chaos. So I am pretty freaked out by this story because we, Joe, I know you might not have heard, but I remember a couple of weeks ago we talked about how smart cities are implementing some of this technology into streetlights for mm -hmm. monitoring people's ongoings and things like that. Actually, that's happening here in San Diego. But this is an interesting thing that Ford is moving forward with. What do you guys think about it? Well, I'm I'm under the impression that this would be so this sounds like they're doing this for traffic stuff, right? So like speeding and for um being in the carpool lane when you don't have two people in your car or more or uh very sort of non-invasive um can sort of passively observe the behaviors and then ticket later. I think it's almost like a moving traffic cam is kind of how I'm thinking of it. I, I think the RoboCop uh, that, that's mentioned in the title, I think it's it's a little bit um, sort of misleading in the fact that, you know, we're not actually going to have police vehicles that are going to pull you over and potentially detain people. <laughs> you know, I think, I think that, I think it's good though, because, I mean, I can't tell you how many times there are jackholes on the road where you're just like, come on, man. And there's no cops around, but if you just have sort of a more autonomous force that's uh, passively observing, then more people are going to follow the rules. I don't know. What do you, what do you think, Joe? Uh, I <laughs> I've had different experiences with it. I think it all depends on how it's implemented. So a couple examples come to my mind. Uh, you know, once I got a ticket because yeah, like Blake was saying, there's a, a camera at a stoplight, and uh, 
I stopped probably six inches in front of like the white line for the stop sign. And they snapped a picture of that and sent me a picture or sent me the picture with my ticket and said, you got to pick this now. So, you know, and that was kind of like I was trying to make the turn and I was inching up and uh, I was in the right lane. And I don't know, it was very contestable, right? Like, who knows at what point it took that picture? Uh, what's the accuracy? What's the threshold of sure. the you know rules that it's it's holding you up against? <laughs> so I don't know what kind of accuracy it'll have, uh, but I think it's going to be a really contentious issue. Uh, additionally, I think you know as this technology progresses, it's inevitable to some point, right? This is going to occur one way or another. Uh, I really foresee a whole tech race between you know just regular drivers and uh, this RoboCop car. I mean, that's what happened when they. They had uh, radar detectors, right? What was the first thing that popped up? Uh, radar detectors, or, or excuse me, what are they called? Um, yeah, yeah, it's like the little detectors, detectors right? yeah. Yeah, radar guns, right. And then they detect them by radar detectors. So it alerts you to what they're using against you, and you have a, a way to prepare yourself to you know, deter that. So I think you'll see that... Uh, you know, there's going to be people with jammers or, you know, stuff to confuse the sensors on all these autonomous vehicles. And it should be pretty fun. It'll be like a little tech race between cops and robbers. <laughs> yeah, maybe there'd be some sort of invisibility cloak that uh, people can attach to their car that mutes, it, it, like dampen signals going out of it. So, you know, or like a jammer for these cars. I don't know. That's probably yeah, pretty much pretty much the Batmobile, right? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Blake, what are you thinking on this one? So I got it's kind of like an interesting dichotomy, it feels like, because obviously this provides a giant way to make revenue for the state. Right. Because now you're catching even more people on these basic basically moving in traffic violations. So, OK, uh, we're, we're paying a lot more towards law enforcement for these things. But also, like you said, like people that typically get away with this stuff, it should change driving behavior. But I've kind of got a little bit of a more twisted thought about it and this is this goes back to the point that we keep bringing up about what's going to happen in terms of liability when we're talking about autonomous cars because if this stuff really starts getting big and i start getting a bunch of tickets you can bet that i'll be the first in line to get a self-driving car especially if they have if the self-driving car has to be the one that is responsible for adhering to all the laws because then you've got this weird gap of who's responsible if the car makes a mistake is it me because i was sitting in the back seat just you know dr along for the ride to work or because the you know, algorithm within the car's program itself made the wrong decision. Who gets who gets ticketed in that case? Right. So I think it it just brings a lot of strange kind of ethical areas that are going to come about, and it just should it's going to create a lot of fun, I think, uh, law making problems. Yeah. So Joe, you mentioned that you're in aerospace and working on uh, drones and and things like that. I'm curious. Who's at fault right now when the drone is on autonomous flight? Is it the pilot or is it the... Well, yeah, it depends on what type of drones you're talking about. So, you know, defense, that's a totally different ballgame uh, versus your, your you know, hobbyist quadricopter guy. Sure. Um, so, you know, military's got... They play by their own rules, right? So that's not really something that's interesting to talk about. But uh, as far as hobbyists go, um, you know... <laughs> They're definitely at fault. There's all these kids taking these uh, courses to get certified as a drone pilot, right? Quote, unquote, drone pilot. And they're like, oh, I'm a pilot. Uh, and and they, they feel like it's empowering to them and they can go wherever they want. And they bend the rules. I've seen it myself. Uh, they fly right next to airports. Uh, they, they fly right next to other, you know, expensive equipment. And if it goes down, you know, they could just run away. Um, so as far as who's at fault, it depends on what the application is. But right now it's in it's in you know, the hands of the operator. There's not really a lot of commercially consumable drones that have a lot of autonomy to them at this point, at least with like, you know, decent price tags. Sure. So we'll see more and more of that popping up. Um, but right now, you know, <laughs> it's, it's in the hobbyist hands. That's where the responsibility lies. And, and you've seen them start to, uh, you know, lose trust from the FAA and, and other industries, uh, because of their irresponsibility. So it's a new frontier in many different areas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. All right, guys. Do you have any other closing thoughts on this one before we uh, move on? 
Let's keep it moving. Okay. All right. Before we get going, though, I want to thank all of our friends over at Engadget, TechCrunch, and Gizmodo for all of our stories this week. If you guys want to follow along, you can follow us all over social media for links to these original articles. We do post those as we find them. And if you want, you can also join us in our Slack. They get them first. And uh, we also tend to discuss them in our Slack channel. Again, link is in the show description. All right, Blake, why don't we get into our next story? All right, so here we go. Amazon taking over the world once again. So Amazon Go is the company's first brick-and-mortar convenience store that opened last week in Seattle. The store is employing unique technology that Amazon believes can make checkout lines a thing of the past. Modern technology actually enables shoppers to simply grab the items off the shelves and automatically get charged the right amount without stopping to pay upon their exit. So no lines, no waiting, but how in the world is this happening? Well, the store is actually outfitted with cameras and shelf sensors to help Amazon's computer vision system work some of its magic. The technologies, in turn, then connect to your phone and once you s- that you scan at the entrance. And so when you leave with the items, they're just charged to your Amazon account. And on rare occasions, a human is actually needed to confirm that technology got it right. Man, he- this is now all starting to make sense to me with Amazon opening up like bookstores and now this convenience store, their brick and mortar, like, uh, I don't know, strategy now is starting to really come to life. I think with all these in-store connected devices. Yeah, this is interesting. So at first I thought Amazon go was, uh, that popular AR app on your phone where you use pokeballs to catch things from, uh, amazon.com and that's how you buy stuff. But actually, (laughs) <laughs> I think, no, this is this is really interesting. It's changing the way that we're, like you said, Blake, that we're interacting with these brick-and-mortar stores, right? Because you're going to walk up, you're going to take something, you're going to walk out, it's going to charge you automatically. It knows who you are, it knows what you grabbed. Um, and that's interesting, but at the same time, they're making buying stuff really easy. If you think about it from the human factors or UX perspective, right? They are literally going into a store. You cannot steal from this thing because it knows who you are. It knows what you grabbed. It knows everything. It knows your bank account information to charge you. So it's all good. And if not, then then they're out like what? A, a couple dollars on a product. Exactly. And you're also putting now humans in a much more supervisory role. I mean, I don't really know what is what the details are behind Amazon's computer vision system that the article mentions. But if if they're creating it and really like implementing their first store, it's got to be good enough to at least they don't really feel like they need a whole bunch of employees in a store. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, too. I mean, we've talked before on the show um about sort of humans taking this backseat role is kind of like we said, uh, supervisory and automating a lot of the processes. And I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I, honestly at stores at brick and mortar stores, I go through self checkout because I don't want to deal with a human. I, I feel like I can do it faster, more efficiently. And, um, you know, it, it, that's just me, but this is even easier because you just pick it up and go, Joe, what are you thinking about this thing? Oh, a couple things. Yeah. So it's nice to see that, you know, Amazon's been criticized of basically taking down mom and pop brick and mortar stores all over. Right. Because of, of, you know, Amazon Prime is so awesome. So it seems like they're trying to reinvigorate that whole market. But of course, profit from it at the same time. So I guess that's, you know, I understand what they're doing. It's kind of cool. Uh, I heard a story on NPR about this last week. And yeah, they just opened up one in Seattle, I believe. Right. Um so one lady was talking about her experience and it's, you know, uh, just how you described it. Uh, she's like, it was cool. Um, it may be something nice to go check out, but it's not on the definite things of like things to see in Seattle. So she seemed like it was cool. She could deal with it. She didn't really seem excited about it. And I thought that was fascinating because, you know, I'm a tech nerd, probably like you guys are. I'd be super excited. I'd be testing it out, you know, taking stuff off the scales, putting it back on, seeing if it registers. It seemed to, you know, charge me correctly, all these things, yeah. poking all the buttons and trying to break it, right? Um, so that's when, you know, w- w- when people start doing that and, and start really seeing the rigidity of how well it works, it might catch on. It might be more exciting. Uh, but people are just kind of still too used to that typical shopping experience. It'll be interesting to see how quickly they grasp this new concept, Um because it's going to make some people feel uncomfortable as well. Yeah, so this is this is a grocery store, right? This is just simple groceries. Yeah. 
that we're looking at. I'm wondering, like, I think the true um, sort of marker of success of this technology will be when larger retailers like Target, Walmart, Home Depot, uh, the, the, these larger retails, retailers, when they start to adopt s- some sort of technology like this, uh, that's really when it's going to sort of be ubiquitous in the way that I don't know. I'm still stuck on that comment that you said where the woman wasn't excited about it <laughs> because because if you think about it, she shouldn't be excited. This should be just another. The Amazon has done it right if she's not excited. Uh, only tech nerds like us should be excited because <laughs> there's so many human factors implications for it. But the fact that everyday people are not excited for it and it's just another way to get their stuff easy, quickly, efficiently, that's the marker of good UX or good human factors is when you don't notice it. Yeah, I mean, and they, she said the store was pretty dead. So, you know, it wasn't really uh, like turkey season before Thanksgiving, you know. It wasn't all crazy in there. So it'll be interesting to see how it handles that type of load. Well, you um, know why but, it's dead is because people get in and out. <laughs> You're right. Maybe that'll alleviate that issue. Um, but it's funny you brought up the fact, you know, if these big box stores start doing that, because uh, there's a bunch of rumors flying around that Amazon is shooting to buy Target sometime either this year or next. Oh, yeah, I did see and, that. And they're using this Amazon Go as sort of a, a platform to test this whole point of sale system. Uh, and if it's successful, they want to implement it in big box stores like that. So it's definitely coming. Yeah. Blake, do you have any other uh, thoughts on this one? That what Joe just said was immediately what my mind jumped to. Was, I, all I can think of is that Amazon's going to own those big box stores, and that's what they're going to become, and that's how it's going to proliferate all this tech. Uh, but I agree with with you, uh, Nick, that the more seamless it is, the better it'll be. But I I really want to see it when it gets chaotic in a bigger store, um, when when you know either like some some piece of tech is released that's being launched everywhere, or, or just, just the holiday Friday. season. Yeah, Black oh, yeah. Friday would be just hilarious. Oh man, uh, that's yeah, it, that would be yeah. really intense. Or it would be cool to see how it how it deals with the stress on the system. Yeah, no kidding. Black Friday in a grocery store has got to be crazy. <laughs> and then also, like, how does it tie it? To, you know, like, what if it's your kid that goes in there and just goes to town on like the candy aisle, and he just walks right out, and you don't find out until <laughs> the next day, and he's. He's eating all your can- like. What's where's the responsibility lie? How are the accounts divided? There's there's just a lot of issues that they yeah. got to tackle, but uh, I think it is inevitably going to take over. Well, your point with another. your point with the kid is something that these large tech companies, Google, Apple, Amazon, are already dealing with in in game app purchases, right? Where yeah. <laughs> these kids will just buy millions of dollars worth of the pay for currency in the game, and and uh, you know the parents go what? So. <laughs> Yeah, I, it's an interesting thing for sure, and I'm, uh, I, I cannot wait to like try this out when they open one here in San Diego. Uh, real quick, what do you think if you tried one out? Would there be something that, uh, like, what would happen that would turn you off and say, you know, this is they're not ready, they're not, they don't deserve my business? Like, what, what are you really looking for to go wrong to to turn you the other way? I think it would come down to charging me for more than I purchased. I think that like be more lenient. Like if I got away with more stuff, which is technically st- loss uh, tweaking in their system, that uh, that's it for me. What about you, Blake? Store as long as you use a credit card that's hooked to your actual Amazon account, you just get whatever some kind of you know in betweener PayPal system to kind of help me keep everything secure. That's my operating system on your phone to be up to date. And what if you didn't update or there was an update that dropped? Uh, you know, accuracies in the, in the cart and whatnot. But also just, uh, I, I guess, does it feel, is it going to have what I need? Is it going to do what it's supposed to do? Uh, is it going to make me feel like they're tracking everything that you buy? Uh, that's part of the experience as well. And then they throw more targeted advertising. Or a headset to prevent a disconnection between your sense of motion and what you see. The approach would use makes makes it very portable. Researchers aren't guaranteed to implement this kind of technology as a that way too. She cannot look down at the at her phone while I'm driving and uh, I say to me I've looked into this uh, and, and read a lot of research on this very topic um, yeah it's all passenger seat you know I'll, I'll kind of like if I'm wearing a, a baseball cap I'll pull it down so I can't see the window phone holder and it's right up in my field of vision so I can't see like you know I see less of the stationary environment like is 
does it work the same or or what if you're uh you know what if you uh are the VR guy here but the there is an interesting way that you could do this where you sort of me and it'd be I, i'd be curious to see how they're planning on implementing this like i'm thinking of uh, literally something that in your vision looks like uh, fluorescent tubes, <laughs> but um, probably more like LED strips or something. I, I, I'm just curious to see how, because glasses, um, it, they're glasses, and I'm trying to think like where they would be to sort of things that I am seeing. Does it only happen from like mid mid glasses to the external, right? So Little circles around around it. <laughs> so, so the idea pretty is, minimal. So the idea is that it would kind of just travel along. Betting it into the car itself, and that's the implementation I'm kind of a little more interested in, because the glasses, I don't know, I'd probably just, you know, suck it up. Well, this would uh, probably be primarily for passing. Getting shit done, or things done when you're driving along, which I think is great, because, I mean, if I could... Or, well, no, that was the last story. Should we move into Reddit? <laughs> Let's do it. We have time for both of these. Let's let's go ahead and tackle them both. First one comes today by Anzi Glover. As Neg Glover. I can't say that name. <laughs> anyway, they go on, to, on designing a solution for something that I will be told about in person. Aside from taking... In-person design exercise, and this is the last hour of whatever you're doing there, I hope they're giving you enough time to prep for this thing. Either that or it should be something relatively simple to do, or at least not... Not something you should have have a lot of preparation for. I mean, it, a lot of InDesign challenges, besides some of the web developments I've had, web development ones I've had from some clients, are they're very much just trying to understand your process. So if you want to brush up on anything, like really have your process refined about how you go about tackling any kind of design related problem, what who you would talk to, you know, would you, what information you would gather prior to even trying to come up with any designs, that kind of stuff. Uh, Joe, do you have anything to throw on this one? Yeah, you have all great points. Um, I, I'd like to echo all of those. Um, but yeah, you know, it should be a high level explanation. They're not looking for you to get too down and dirty into the details here. Um, so, you know, I'm sure it, it reminds me of a job talk almost a little bit, right? Uh, so keep things at a higher level. You know, definitely memorize UX or UI design principles and try and relate them to, you know, whatever process you're um, you're asked about there. Uh, and also be cognizant of how you explain, um, you know, what, what you're designing a solution for, uh, whether it's, I don't know if you have a whiteboard or if it's on a piece of paper, but, you know, use all the tools you got to make it visually appealing, easy to understand, you know, practice what you preach here. Right. You know what I mean? Um, so those, those are my tips. Yeah. I, I think the only other thing I would add, uh, add to that, um, you guys, both bring, bring up some good points there. Um, if you're really concerned about some of the things you may see, look up uh, additional design challenges that employees or employers may ask potential job candidates uh, because this will give you practice and literally look at the prompt and prompt and try to do it um, in the moment. And that will give you something that you are not expecting Um and give yourself like however much time an hour to do it. And if you're leading up to the the event, uh, just give yourself maybe one a day to to give you that practice. That way you'll be at least prepared to, uh, like Blake said, exercise your process when you get there. And it doesn't have to be the right answer. It just has to be. It just has to look like you tried uh, using the correct processes and procedures. Exactly. All right. Well, do we have anything to add to that? I think I think if somebody follows all that advice, they're going to crush that final interview. Yeah. yeah. Good luck. Good luck, bro. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um okay. And and oh, one other thing to add to that. If you do look up that list and it just so happens to be one of them that they use, then even better. Then then you're totally prepared. <laughs> okay. So let's go ahead and jump into this next one. This one is from Co-Captain Jack, also from the user experience subreddit. Co-Captain Jack writes, what is your general advice for interviews in UX? That's interview theme today, guys. Um, 
Co-captain Jack goes on to write, I am a recent graduate looking for a job in UX or human factors uh, and would love to hear some tips or strategies for handling the job interviews slash getting myself into the field for my first job. All advice is welcome. Thank you much. All right, Joe, I'm going to throw it to you first this one. What do you think? Sure. Uh, First and foremost, it's definitely really important to have a strong UX portfolio. Um, These can be, you know, samples from schoolwork. Uh, You know, I had a small uh, portfolio that I made when I was job hunting and majoritively they were pulled from group projects or final projects and stuff. Um, And, you you know, sterilize them as you need to, uh, but highlight the important things that, you know, you felt were the most relevant to the job that you're interviewing for and talk about those. Um, uh, Also, you know, I'm a big fan of customizing resumes. Just he was asking about how to get into the field and, and really get some visibility out there. Um, I like to custom make a resume for each position that I apply to. Uh, They have a lot of systems out there, a lot of automated systems that scan through each resume. It's not normally just a person reading each one, right? And it hits upon uh, keywords or hot words that tend to be, you know, the big uh, requirements in the the, um, skills needed section for the job description. Uh, And if you repeat those several times and and emphasize those words, uh, you'll tend to get picked up a lot quicker than, than the next guy. So I've had success with that. Highly recommend it. All right, Blake, what do you think? Joe, those are some excellent tips for sure. I might even use that to clean up some of my resume stuff. (laughs) I'm Um, here for it. If you need help, I'm here. (laughs) Very good. All right, so I have like two really big things that have helped me a lot, especially from the freelance uh, point of view. But one thing that I did before a lot of interviews with like if if it was clients or even job interviews is I would take the time and everything that was on my resume, I would spend, you know, about 10 minutes writing about my like a day in the life of that job so if anybody asks me like hey this first point on your resume tell me about what you specifically did you've already got it in your mind what you want to say or the things you should hit on upon and you come off a lot smoother um so just it makes everything seem like you're just very cool calm and collected you already know all the points to hit and it's just kind of a helpful technique that i found that works really well um another one and this is this requires kind of a lot of upfront work, and it's one of those things that it might be really good, especially if you're brand new to a field, is do research on the company. And if their products are available, um, like if it's an app, if it's a software thing, try and provide them extra value. Like go through your entire interview process, but at the very end, leave them with something, whether this is like a basic heuristic review of what they're of something on their app or suggestions for features that you could add or how you would integrate with the development team to get things done, like leave them with like a little packet or a note or a USB drive that they can take away and look at your actual work. Uh, that's actually landed a couple different projects for me just uh and it's and it also helps kind of if you feel like you had a bad interview at least you show them your work and if they take the time to look at it more than not you'll at least get a call back yeah those are good points i think getting or handling the job interviews has been uh pretty well covered by you guys i'm going to get into getting yourself into the field for your first job now there's a couple ways you can go about this uh i often suggest asking the people who you know um because a lot of times job opportunities will be because of the people you know. Um, now, how do you do that if you don't know anybody who works somewhere you want to work? Well, you go to these professional conferences. UXPLA has some great conferences, Human Factors and Ergonomic Society. There are a ton of them that you can go out and, and get to. And I know that money might be tight if you're looking for a job, but I promise the connections that you make there may be worth it if you find someone that is in the same domain as you that you can ping potentially later for a job. Um, They often, a lot of times these, uh, these conferences have job fairs as well. I know HFES for sure has um, a job fair where you can go in, submit your resume and then they do interviews on site and potentially call you back later, uh, fly you out to wherever the corporate headquarters is. Um, and that's another good way of getting into the field for your first job. Um, I don't know. Do you guys have any other thoughts on that one? I, I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, I personally have had tremendous success by uh, going to HFES. You know, I've gone multiple times uh, throughout my, my career as a student. 
And that's how I got my first major internship at Honeywell Aerospace. Uh, I took a year off of grad school for that. It was an incredible uh, opportunity. That's how I interviewed for my position uh, where I met Blake over at NASA Ames Research Center. Uh, and that's how I interviewed for a couple other jobs that I eventually turned down. But the amount of visibility you get there is tremendous. I mean, you got to remember, Human Factors, it's a pretty small world. Uh, I know for a fact a lot of the people that I've read about or, or read studies on, uh, those authors, they're at those conferences, and they're out shaking hands and giving cards out and, and hooking people up with positions or, or other connections. Um, so, you know, don't don't uh, underestimate the power of going to a conference and, and hitting up those job fairs they have inside of them. Yeah. Yeah. And if money happens to be tight, something, uh, another way to go at it is a lot of these conferences allow you to volunteer. Um, so that's another big way to get into a conference and go and meet people and, you know, show that you're willing to volunteer for something so big and put time and effort into something that you're not getting paid for. That goes a long way as well. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, do you have any other closing thoughts or should we wrap this thing up? Let's wrap it. All right, that's it for today, everyone. Let us know what you guys think of the stories this week. Did you like them, hate them? Let us know. Jump on our Slack. <laughs> you know, we always love the conversation over there, whether or not the stories are good. If you have any suggestions for topics or news stories, you can follow us all over social media. Head on over to the Human Factors Cast LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. Be sure to check out our SoundCloud. You can leave us a comment over there. We love hearing from you guys. If you want to talk to us directly, that's fine, too. Uh, you can send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com, or if you want to leave a voicemail, you can do that at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. You can also support us on our Patreon if you want to support us financially. We love that uh, at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. If you don't have money, money uh, money's tight. It's okay. You're looking for a job. We understand. What you can do instead is be sure to like, subscribe, review us on whatever your favorite podcast directory is. And of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank my panel for being on the show today. Joe Ott, where can our listeners find you if they want to get in touch? Oh, sure. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, linkedin.com slash in slash Joseph Ott 87. Perfect. And you're hanging out on our Slack now, too. Uh, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf, where can our listeners go and find you if they want to hang out with you? Oh, as always, you guys can find me in the Human Factors cast, sl cast slack, but you can also find me on Twitter at Don't Panic UX. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again, guys, for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it, it depends. depends.